Chapter Twenty of the Beast of Tarzan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James Christopher. The Beast of Tarzan by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter Twenty. Jungle Island Again. The first consideration of the party was to locate fresh water and make camp, for all knew that their term of existence upon Jungle Island might be drawn out to months or even years. Tarzan knew the nearest water, and to this he immediately led the party. Here the men fell to work to construct shelters and rude furniture, while Tarzan went into the jungle after meat, leaving the faithful Mugambi and the Musala woman to guard Jane, whose safety he would never trust to any member of the Kincaid's cutthroat crew. Lady Greystoke suffered far greater anguish than any of the other castaways, for the blow to her hopes and her already cruelly lacerated mother heart lay not with her own privations, but in the knowledge that she might now never be able to learn the fate of her firstborn, or do aught to discover his whereabouts, or ameliorate his condition, a condition which imagination naturally pictured in the most frightful forms. For two weeks the party divided the time amongst the various duties which had been allotted to each. A daylight watch was maintained from sunrise to sunset upon a bluff near the camp, a jutting shoulder of rock which overlooked the sea. Here, ready for instant lighting, was gathered a huge pile of dry branches, while from a lofty pole which they had set in the ground there floated an improvised distress signal fashioned from a red undershirt which belonged to the mate of the Kincaid. But never a speck upon the horizon that might be sail or smoke rewarded the tired eyes that in their endless hopeless vigil strained daily out across the vast expanse of ocean. It was Tarzan who suggested, finally, that they attempt to construct a vessel that would bear them back to the mainland. He alone could show them how to fashion rude tools, and when the idea had taken root in the minds of the men, they were eager to commence their labors. But as time went on, and the Herculean nature of their task became more and more apparent, they fell to grumbling and quarreling amongst themselves, so that to the other dangers were now added dissension and suspicion. More than ever before did Tarzan now fear to leave Jane among the half-brutes of the Kincaid's crew, but hunting he must do, for none other could so surely go forth and return with meat as he. Sometimes Mugambi spelled him at the hunting, but the black spear and arrows were never so sure of the results as of the rope and knife of the ape-man. Finally the men shirked their work, going off into the jungle by twos to explore and to hunt. All this time the camp had seen no sign of Sheeta or a cut in the other great apes, though Tarzan had sometimes met them in the jungle as he hunted. As matters tended from bad to worse in the camp of the castaways upon the east coast of Jungle Island, Another camp came into being upon the north coast. Here in a little cove lay a small schooner, the Cowry, whose deck had but a few days since run red with the blood of her officers and the loyal members of her crew, for the Cowry had fallen upon bad days when it had shipped such men as Gust and Mamula the Maori, and that archfiend Kai Shang of Fachan. There were others too, ten of them all told, the scum of the South Sea ports, but Gust and Mamula and Kai Shang were the brains and cunning of the company. It was they who had instigated the mutiny, that they might seize and divide the catch of pearls which constituted the wealth of the cowrie's cargo. It was Kai Shang who had murdered the captain as he lay asleep in his berth, and it had been Mamula the Maori who had led the attack upon the officer of the watch. Gust, after his own peculiar habit, had found the means to delegate to the others the actual taking of life. Not that Gust entertained any scruples on the subject, other than those which induced him a rare regard for his own personal safety. There was always a certain element of risk to the assassin, for victims of deadly assault are seldom prone to die quietly and considerately. There was always a certain element of risk to go so far as dispute the issue with the murderer. It was this chance of dispute which Gus preferred to forego. But now that the work was done, the Swede aspired to the position of highest command among the mutineers. He had even gone so far as to appropriate and wear certain articles belonging to the murder captain of the cowry, articles of apparel which bore upon them the badges and insignia of authority. Kai Sheng was peeved. He had no love for authority, and certainly not the slightest intention of submitting to the domination of an ordinary Swede sailor. The seeds of discontent were, therefore, already planted in the camp of the mutineers of the Cowrie at the north edge of Jungle Island. But Kai Sheng realized that he must act with circumspection, for Gust alone of the motley horde possessed sufficient knowledge of navigation to get them out of the South Atlantic and around the Cape to more congenial waters, where they might find a market for their ill-gotten wealth, and no questions asked. The day before, they sighted Jungle Island and discovered the little landlocked harbor upon the bosom of which the cowry now rode quietly at anchor. The watch had discovered the smoke and funnels of a warship upon the southern horizon. The chance of being spoken to and investigated by a man of war appealed not at all to any of them, so they put into hiding for a few days until the danger should have passed. 
and now Gus did not wish to venture out to sea again. There was no telling, he insisted, but that the ship he had seen was actually searching for them. Kai Shang pointed out that such could not be the case, since it was impossible for any human being other than themselves to have knowledge of what had transpired above the cowrie. But Gust was not to be persuaded. In his wicked heart he nursed a scheme whereby he might increase his share of the booty by something like one hundred percent. He alone could sell the cowrie. Therefore the others could not leave Jungle Island without him, but what was there to prevent Gust, with just sufficient men to man the schooner, slipping away from Kai Shang, Mamula the Maori, and some half of the crew when opportunity presented. It was for this opportunity that Gust waited. Some day there would come a moment when Kai Shang, Mamula, and three or four of the others would be absent from the camp, exploring or hunting. The Swede racked his brain for some plan whereby he might successfully lure from the sight of the anchored ship those whom he had determined to abandon. To this end he organized hunting party after hunting party, but always the devil of perversity seemed to enter the soul of Kai Shang so that wily Celestial would never hunt except in the company of Gust himself. One day, Kai Shang spoke secretly with Mumuli the Maori, pouring into the brown ear of his companion the suspicions which he harbored concerning the Swede. Mamula was for going immediately and running a long knife through the heart of the traitor. It is true that Kai Shang had no other evidence than the natural cunning of his own knavish soul, but he imagined in the intentions of Gust what he himself would have been glad to accomplish had the means lain at hand. But he dared not let Mamula slay the Swede, upon whom they depended to guide them to their destination. They decided, however, that it would do no harm to attempt to frighten Gust into acceding to their demands, and with this purpose in mind the Maori sought out the self-constituted commander of the party. When he broached the subject of immediate departure, Gust again raised the former objection, that the warship might very probably be patrolling the sea directly in their southern path, waiting for them to make the attempt to reach other waters. Mamula scoffed at the fears of his fellow, pointing out that as no one aboard any warship knew of their mutiny, there could be no reason why they should be suspected. Ah, exclaimed Gust, there is where you are wrong. There is where you are lucky that you have an educated man like me to tell you what to do. You are an ignorant savage, Mamula, and so you know nothing of wireless. The Maori leaped to his feet and laid his hand upon the hilt of his knife. I am no savage, he shouted. I was only joking, the Swede hesitated to explain. We are old friends, Mamula. We cannot afford to quarrel, at least not while old Kai Shang is plotting to steal all the pearls from us. If he could find a man to navigate the cowrie, he would leave us in a minute. All this talk about getting away from here is just because he has some scheme in his head to get rid of us. But the wireless, asked Mamula, what has the wireless to do with our remaining here? Oh, yes, replied Gus, scratching his head. He was wondering if the Mamori were really so ignorant as to believe the preposterous lie he was about to unload upon him. Oh, yes. You see, every warship is equipped with what they call a wireless apparatus. It lets them talk to other ships hundreds of miles away, and lets them listen to all that is said on those other ships. Now, you see, when you fellows were shooting up the cowrie, you did a whole lot of loud talking, and there isn't any doubt but that that warship was a laying off the south of us listening to all of it. Of course, they may not have learned the name of the ship, but they heard enough to know that the crew of some ship was mutinying and killing her officers. So you see, they'll be waiting to search every ship in sight for a long time to come, and they may not be far away now. When he had ceased speaking, the Swede strove to assume an air of composure that his listener might not have his suspicions aroused as to the truth of the statements that had just been made. Mamula sat for some time in silence, eyeing Gust. At last he rose. You are a great liar, said he. If you don't get us on our way by tomorrow, you'll never have another chance to lie, for I heard two of the men saying that they'd like to run a knife into you, and that if you kept them in this hole any longer, they'd do it. Go and ask Kai Shang if there is not a wireless, replied Gust. He will tell you that there is such a thing, and that vessels can talk to one another across hundreds of miles of water. Then say to the two men who wish to kill me that if they do so, they will never live to spend their share of the swag, for only I can get you safely to any port. So Mamula went to Kai Shang, and asked him if there was such an apparatus as a wireless, by means of which ships could talk to each other at great distances, and Kai Shang told him that there was. Mamula was puzzled, but he still wished to leave the island, and was willing to take his chances upon the open sea, rather than to remain longer in the monotony of the camp. If only we had someone else who could navigate a ship, wailed Kai Wang. That afternoon, Mamula went hunting with two other Maoris. They hunted toward the south, and had not gone far from camp when they were surprised by the sound of voices ahead of them in the jungle. They knew that none of their own men had preceded them, and, as all were convinced that the island was uninhabited, 
they were inclined to flee in terror on the hypothesis that the place was haunted, possibly by the ghost of the murdered officers and men of the cavalry. But Mamula was even more curious than he was superstitious, and so he quelled his natural desire to flee from the supernatural. Motioning his companions to follow his example, he dropped to his hands and knees, crawling forward stealthily and with quakings of heart through the jungle in the direction from which came the voices of the unseen speakers. Presently, at the edge of a little clearing, he halted, and there he breathed a deep sigh of relief, for plainly before him he saw two flesh-and-blood men sitting upon a fallen log and talking earnestly together. One was Schneider, mate of the Kincaid, and the other was a seaman named Schmidt. "'I think we can do it, Schmidt,' Schneider was saying. "'A good canoe wouldn't be hard to build, and three of us could paddle it to the mainland in a day if the wind was right and the sea reasonably calm. There ain't no use waiting for the men to build a big enough boat to take the whole party, for they're sore now and sick of working like slaves all day long. It ain't none of our business anyway to save the Englishman. Let him look out for himself, says I. He paused for a moment, and then, eyeing the other to note the effect of his next words, he continued. But we might take the woman. It would be a shame to leave a nice-looking piece like she is in such a got-forsaken hole as this here island. Schmidt looked up and grinned. So that's how it's blowing, is it? he asked. Why didn't you say so in the first place? What's in it for me if I help you? She ought to pay us well to get her back to civilization, explained Schneider. And I tell you what I'll do. I'll just whack it up with two men that helps me. I'll take half, and they can divide the other half. You and whoever the other bloke is. I'm sick of this place, and the sooner I get out of it, the better I'll like it. What do you say? Suits me, replied Schmidt. I wouldn't know how to reach the mainland myself, and I know that none of the other fellows would. So as you're the only one that knows anything in navigation, you're the fellow I'll tie to. Mamula the Maori pricked up his ears. He had a smattering of every language that is spoken upon the seas, and more than a few times he had sailed on English ships, so that he understood fairly well all that had passed between Schneider and Schmidt since he had stumbled upon them. He rose to his feet and stepped into the clearing. Schneider and his companion started as nervously as though a ghost had risen before them. Schneider reached for his revolver. Mamula raised his right hand, palm forward, as a sign of his specific intentions. "'I am a friend,' he said. "'I heard you, but do not fear that I will reveal what you have said. I can help you, and you can help me.' He was addressing Snyder. You can navigate a ship, but you have no ship. We have a ship, but no one to navigate it. If you come with us and ask no questions, we will let you take the ship where you will after you have landed us at a certain port, the name of which I will give you later. You can take the woman of whom you speak, and we will ask no questions either. Is it a bargain? Snyder desired more information, and got as much as Mamula thought best to give him. Then the Maori suggested that they speak with Kai Shang. The two members of the Kincaid's company followed Mamula and his fellows to a point in the jungle close by the camp of the mutineers. Here Mamula hid them while he went in search of Kai Shang, first admonishing his Maori companions to stand guard over the two sailors, lest they change their minds and attempt to escape. Snyder and Schmidt were virtually prisoners, though they did not know it. Presently Mamula returned with Kai Shang, to whom he had briefly narrated the details of the stroke of good fortune that had come to them. The Chinaman spoke at length with Schneider, until, notwithstanding his natural suspicion of the sincerity of all men, he became quite convinced that Schneider was quite as much a rogue as himself, and that the fellow was anxious to leave the island. These two premises accepted, there could be little doubt that Schneider would prove trustworthy in so far as accepting the command of the cowrie was concerned. After that, Kai Sheng knew that he could find means to coerce the man into submission to his further wishes. When Schneider and Schmidt left them, and set out in the direction of their own camp, it was with feelings of far greater relief than they had experienced in many a day. Now, at last, they saw a feasible plan for leaving the island upon a seaworthy craft. There would be no more hard labor at shipbuilding, and no risking their lives upon a crudely built makeshift that would be quite as likely to go to the bottom as it would to reach the mainland. Also, they were to have assistance in capturing the woman, or rather, women, for when Mamula had learned that there was a black woman in the other camp, he had insisted that she be brought along as well as the white woman. As Kai Shang and Mamula entered their camp, it was with the realization that they no longer needed Gust. They marched straight to the tent in which they might expect to find him at that hour of the day. For though it would have been more comfortable for the entire party to remain aboard the ship, they had mutually decided that it would be safer for all concerned were they to pitch their camp ashore. Each knew that in the heart of the others was sufficient treachery to make it unsafe for any member of the party to go ashore, leaving the others in position of the cowrie. So, not more than two or three men at a time were ever permitted aboard the vessel unless all the balance of the company was there too. 
As the two crossed toward Gusta's tent, the Maori felt the edge of his long knife with one grimy, calloused thumb. The Swede would have felt far from comfortable could he have seen this significant action, or read what was passing amid the convolutions of the brown man's cruel brain. Now it happened that Gus was at that moment in the tent occupied by the cook, and this tent stood but a few feet from his own, so that he heard the approach of Kai Shang and Mamula, though he did not, of course, dream that it had any special significance for him. Chance had it, though, that he glanced out of the doorway of the cook's tent at the very moment that Kai Shang and Mamula approached the entrance to his, and he thought that he noted a stealthiness in their movements that comported poorly with amicable or friendly intentions. And then, just as they two slunk within the interior, Gus caught a glimpse of the long knife which Mamula the Maori was then carrying behind his back. The Swede's eyes opened wide, and a funny little sensation assailed the roots of his hairs. Also he turned almost white beneath his tan. Quite precipitately he left the cook's tent. He was not one who required a detailed exposition of intentions that were quite all too obvious. As surely as though he had heard them plotting, he knew that Kai Shang and Mamula had come to take his life. The knowledge that he alone could navigate the cowrie had, up till now, been sufficient assurance of his safety. But, quite evidently, something had occurred of which he had no knowledge, that would make it quite worth the while of his co-conspirators to eliminate him. Without a pause, Gus darted across the beach and into the jungle. He was afraid of the jungle. Uncanny noises that were indeed frightful came forth from its recesses, the tangled mazes of the mysterious country back of the beach. But if Gust was afraid of the jungle, he was far more afraid of Kai Shang and Mamula. The dangers of the jungle were more or less problematical, while the danger that menaced him at the hands of his companions was a perfectly well-known quantity, which might be expressed in terms of a few inches of cold steel, or the coil of a light rope. He had seen Kai Shang garret a man at Pai Shai in a dark alleyway in back of Louis Kata's place. He feared the rope, therefore, more than he did the knife of the Maori, but he feared them both too much to remain within the reach of either. Therefore he chose the pitiless jungle. End of chapter 20